Well, first of all, the, uh, one of the uh, things about self-determination is nobody really necessarily knows what they're talking about, about it, because it, it gets defined in so many ways. It's very hard to, uh, hard to know exactly what uh, self-determination might be or even citizenship. So I think one of the challenges is how to make these words stop being slogans and start being something you can actually do something about. Otherwise, it just sits out there as an abstraction with very little link to actually making a difference in uh, people's lives. And, uh, you know, as we all know, people hide behind slogans, and slogans are an easy way out of a lot of situations because they don't ask us to do anything. We can be in favor of a slogan, but we don't have to change our behavior. And so, in this sense, the values content of slogans is very important because, uh, you know, what is it that's the bottom line in terms of what we're supposed to be doing or what our world should look like? And the, something like self-determination or citizenship in the context uh, in which it is, uh, uh, you, you can't separate it out from the social conditions that produce a people's lives. And for instance, uh, we're now in a period where you might think in the neoliberal kind of economic environment of austerity and so on, uh, what does self-determination look like when people's uh, livelihoods are no longer present? Uh, so how can you be self-determining when the resources just keep disappearing in so many uh, locations? So in this sense, self-determination or citizenship doesn't operate in a vacuum, it operates in a kind of a you know, social order and an economic order that constrain it. For instance, one criticism of individual funding uh, that's very common is it's, uh, it's done for all the wrong reasons by governments. It's a way to save money or things of that sort, and it may be true. So in this sense, context is everything, and context isn't always favorable. Uh, for instance, people do have to make choices uh, in the face of deprived life conditions. You know, you can do anything you want in your miserable circumstances, you know, where all of the choices look pretty awful. Uh, so yes, you have choice, you have self-determination, and you have very little to choose between because there's not much on offer. So in that sense, choice is constrained by the choices available to you. So it's quite different when you've got lots of choices. Uh, a choice looks very, very different. And of course, uh, uh, choice, you know, it could be romanticized is always a good thing, but choices actually can be quite oppressive uh, for a lot of people because there are great burdens that come with choice. Constant dilemmas and balancing factors and stressful uh, decisions and so on. And uh, I, I may just be me, but you know, I find some days I don't like to have to make decisions because they're really painful and they have consequences and so on. So we don't want to turn choice into something that's always a good thing uh, because choice is also has its burdens and can be quite vexing, really. So it's, it's problematic, that version of choice, but much more consistent with human experience. And when we talk about some of these systems, individual funding, self-direction, that sort of thing, uh, you know, it's actually the bigger question that has to be managed is life. And these are simply tools that you take into life, and life's still waiting for you, and life's not always easy. So you've got choice, but it's all about, you know, the tough things of living. And living has never been always that easy, at least in my experience. Other people's lives look easy, you know, to me. Uh, but my own life feels like, at times, like it's kind of overwhelming and complicated and things like that. So. Some days I don't want any more choice, thanks. You know, you decide, you know. Uh, and also, uh, the uh, constraints uh, that are in place, you know, choice doesn't exist in a vacuum, and um, self-determination doesn't either. People are constrained. Systems are constrained. Bureaucracies constrain us. The times we live in constrain us. So choice is never absolute choice. It's always constrained by uh, conditions. So what you really are talking about is self-determination within all of those constraints and making the most of the relative uh, options that you might have. In this regard, very interesting point, 
uh, would be that uh, self-determination or citizenship is developmental. It's not a dichotomous variable, you either have it or you don't. It is a developmental variable because you can develop with self-determination in lots of ways. You can become you know, very good at it, but you can also lose your capacities uh, for self-determination. So in this sense, if you're going to grow, uh, you might use your self-determination in a wiser way, having you know, had some experiences in life and so on. So when we think of it that way, then we're all growing and we're all learning a bit about self-determination every day. Uh, but if you're like me, some days I don't learn anything. In fact, some days I forgot what I learned, you know, and I have to go back and revisit all that. So in that sense, uh, self-determination is always developmental, and of course there are different dimensions of this in the exercise of uh, citizenship. So in this sense, it's kind of a struggle to live with these kinds of concepts uh, and uh, quite challenging. Now one of the things I always like coming to conferences like this is I love the success stories. I find myself very inspired by them. I often cite them you know, when I teach about them and so on. And those are all very good. But no matter what you do with a success story, you haven't told the whole story. And in this sense, a lot of how people become successful the drivers, the things that actually made the difference are lost in the accomplishments. People don't explain the whole story and you see part of it. And it's not a deception, it's just very hard in a short period of time to put everything in and explain everything. And so it's quite possible for people to see something that is successful but not know how to create it because they didn't get enough of the story about how it kind of came to be. And that, that can cause a lot of mischief because then people go try to imitate it but only have half the loaf in terms of trying to figure out how to progress it. So in this sense, uh, one of the things that's always uh, very valuable is, uh, is, is people that know they're only hearing part of the story. And if you can know that, uh, then you can take the story for what it's worth knowing it'd be nicer to go in deeper into the story to name the drivers and analyze what it was that made it possible to do X or, or Y or, or Z. And um, in this regard, uh, an interesting factor is it's quite possible to live at a time when something's not in your vision, so nobody does it. And in this sense, I mean, many of the things that we're doing today might have been inconceivable 20, 30 years ago, because nobody was thinking about them. And it always kind of haunts me a little bit that that's the case because I'm sitting here 30 years later thinking what is it that I don't know now that's not in my vision that should be in my vision because you know things didn't used to be in my vision before but I learned them from examples that people set and so on. So here we sit uh, wondering what it is that ought to be in our thinking here in our, uh, our development and so in this way um, how you can do things is you can only do what you can with what you've known so far. And in this sense, there's always an implied challenge of growth and development, that we are not at the end of the road. We are simply uh, where we are today. And you know, we were able 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, to move to uh, new uh, kind of levels of doing things. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a, and it's a constant kind of exploratory kind of process when you think of it, a kind of collective social movement kind of exercise. And, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the I, mean, I guess the, the, the point to draw from it is, uh, as good as many things are today, we're not done. You know, we have a, a whole lot more to do because people's lives are still not good. I'm grateful for the progress we've made, but I'm also troubled by the things we don't do very well and the fact that, you know, we've talked about things for so long and yet we have so little track record on, in some kinds of dimensions of it. So it's kind of an implied uh, challenge of leadership. We need a, a, a kind of leadership to emerge that tackles the things that aren't being tackled uh, and leaves us, uh, if you like, uh, a way to develop yet further. So in this sense, uh, even our successes uh, kind of instruct us that we still have uh, much to do. Now, having said that, 
I'm grateful uh, that uh, so many people have experimented and have just, you know, kind of moved the ball ahead because of the steps that they took. So in this sense, we're totally indebted to all these people that struggled, uh, you know, families, staff, you know, the person with disability, all kinds of people have struggled to bring us where we are today. And uh, that uh, says something about the idealism of people, the desire to do the right thing. Uh, it says a lot about values. It says a lot about conviction, and determination. It says a lot about struggle, as I said when we set it up. And, uh, you know, as messy as life is, if they hadn't have struggled, we'd be nowhere. So we're in such debt to the people that have pushed that ball up the mountain uh, and have brought us the kinds of opportunities that we have today. And I think many of those people are in the room. And because they're in the room and because they've struggled, uh, we've got some things to look forward to. So I'd like to just finish with just how thankful I am for that and to compliment the many people that have helped bring us to this set of problems. 